Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Charlie Kyle, and I'm the principal of Innes College. It's uh, approximately 7.10, and we said we'd begin at approximately 7.10, so we are going to begin. I'm going to start with the uh, land acknowledgement. We wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and currently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous peoples across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Uh, I'm exceptionally pleased to welcome, uh, in our first virtual event, uh, an Innes alumnus, John Oda. Uh, John is um, an architect by trade and an author by disposition. Uh, he has received degrees from the University of Toronto, obviously, his BA, but also degrees in architecture from the University of BC and also Columbia University. Uh, John is, as I said, an author and his latest uh, book, which is called The Kitchen, A Journey Through History in Search of the Perfect Design, is the springboard for tonight's presentation. Uh, I just want to say a couple of things before we begin, and John will be taking over the show. Um, the first is that I met John uh, first at a reunion, an Innes reunion, and I would say that he was immediately engaged and engaging. Um, I was giving him a tour of the college <laughs> building, and which he was, he's remembering, as you can see. And um, he was uh, a, a wonderful interlocutor. I mean, I did a lot of the talking because I was doing the tour, but... He was so engaged, as I said, and engaging as someone who was taking in what he was seeing and then asking really informed questions. I can only imagine now that the tables have turned and he's going to be the one doing most of the presenting, how uh, involving this will be. So I think we're all in for a great treat. Uh, what I was going to say anecdotally is I had planned uh, to actually have this part of uh, the evening be done in my kitchen because I thought how apt. Some would say how predictable, but. Uh, as, um, as it would happen, uh, tonight my wife planned at the same time a socially distanced dinner party. And so it's not possible for me to be down there, but I was thinking, why are kitchens so important? And I'm sure Dr. John will touch on <clears throat> many reasons why, but one of them is because they're one of the, you could say they're one of few rooms in our homes that are the sources of creations. I mean, obviously those yeah. create, create memories, um, they're cultural touchstones, but you know, on a very, I'd say, just prosaic level, they end up creating <laughs> things like this. So, so I, um, and by the way, this is a great thing about virtual events. <laughs> you get to do this, but I'm not sure the guests downstairs are going to get it because it smells really good. But at any rate, so um, the last thing I'll say before handing it over to John is that uh, one lucky attendee will be receiving a free copy of John's book. Now you might ask, how am I going to get this book? Well, the first thing is you're gonna to have to wait until the event is over because it will only go to someone who is still showing up on the attendees list at the end. Um, and then I think through the wonders of the post, you will be receiving it. Um, so at any rate, that's something to look forward to. You may be the lucky recipient, play your cards right. Um, and, uh, but now without further ado, I'm going to turn <laughs> speaking duties over to our guest of honor, John Oda. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone at Innes for having me here tonight. And thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. My name's John Ota, and I love kitchens. I'm going to take us on a whirlwind 40 minute talk on the evolution of the great North American kitchen. We'll barely touch the surface, but I hope this gives you a taste of the history of our favorite room in the house. My wife, Fran, and I want to renovate our kitchen, but before I design a new kitchen, I want to know everything about the kitchen, the history, the floor plans, the invention of foods and drinks. So I went on a journey to find the perfect kitchen. I explored examples of excellent kitchen designs from throughout North American history so that I can learn from them to improve our own kitchen and then I wrote a book called The Kitchen. If you want to buy it, I know that our bookstores have been closed recently. You can go to penguinrandomhouse.ca, penguinrandomhouse.ca, go to the little search engine with the little magnifying glass and type in John Ota 
the kitchen. Oh, and this is my kitchen right now. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed about this, but um, the, uh, things are out on the counters. There's wasted space in the corner here in front of you. There's no backsplash. I'm going to give you an update at the end of this talk on this kitchen. Considering how important the kitchen is today, it's amazing to think that not long ago, the kitchen was the least desirable room in the home, a place where servants were hidden away in the heat and the smoke and the smells. But today, the kitchen is the centerpiece, the trophy room, the Super Bowl of the entire house. How did this happen? Well, there are three major influences on the evolution of the kitchen. One is innovation of technology. Two is kitchen reform in the 19th century. And three is sociological changes in gender, class, and family roles. And I'll touch on those during the talk. My journey starts with the Pilgrim Kitchen at Plymouth, Massachusetts. In 1620, the Pilgrims sailed into Cape Cod Bay at Plymouth. When they landed, they found the Wampanoag people who lived there for over 12,000 years before them around Cape Cod. They lived in communal longhouses and cooked in the center of the floor plan. And it's the same kind of longhouses that we had here in Ontario. This is up at St. Marie among the Hurons and the interior of our longhouses here in Ontario. Here's back at Plymouth. Plymouth is a village of 18 wood cottages. It's a medieval village. And these are buildings that are built with wattle and daub. That's sticks. And they wound some uh, vines in between. And they push mud into it, into the walls. So they're mud walls. And then they're covered with this wood clapboard. The kitchen is the entire one-room house. The 14-foot by 20-foot interior is rough and spare. It was the bedroom living room and dining room for a family of six to ten people and a wood table in the middle is the prep counter fire is the focus of the house there's no brick fireplace this is simply a fire on a dirt floor and smoke is everywhere there's very little ventilation uh, there's was smoke in my hair smoke in my lungs it was very uncomfortable and here's a photo of me doing the mortar and pestle thing. I'm grinding up spices. I'm smiling for the camera, but really it's hot, it's sweaty, it's smoky. I am not having a good time. It was quite miserable. And that day we prepared roast quail. You can see the roast quail in the foreground on the spit. Uh, there's a duck, fresh duck in the pot braising and fried pumpkin, pumpkin over an open fire. So this was long, miserable work. And I expected bland, bland, bland. But the surprise at Plymouth was that the food was fabulous. Their dishes were as good, if not better, than what we eat today. The pilgrims brought butter, salt, pepper, nutmeg, vanilla, cinnamon with them on the Mayflower. The key is fresh. We had fresh pumpkin. I just pulled it right out of the ground and had to chop it up with a dull knife, which was more work. Uh, fresh duck and fresh quail. This is the Scanning Cabin, Toronto, 1794. So early settlers began with a one-room house. And this is Scanning Cabin down on the, on the lake shore by the CNE. And settlers built a fireplace in the, in the cabin that was supposed to take the smoke away. But it's a one-room cabin. They did everything in the one room. You can see it's this. So they ate in the cabin and did the cooking as well. So if you're uh, eating there, you've got smoke in your face. Everything happens in the one room. Houses eventually expanded to a second room on the back of the house for cooking. And that, this is a house built with a living area in the front and a separate kitchen in the rear. So the extra room or the kitchen in the back of the house was a response to a dire desire for gentility and vanity to impress visitors. When you had people over for dinner, they could eat in the front room and leave the smoke in the back room kitchen. So the front rooms got decorated and furnished with the best possessions and the back room kitchen was left plain like this. And this was the beginning of the separation of the kitchen at the back of the house. Here we are at Thomas Jefferson's Monticello, 1809 in Charlottesville, Virginia. In the American South, mansions kept the kitchen separate from the main house to avoid fires and smells and noise to the main house. And this is one of the most famous historic houses in America and the most architecturally eccentric. When Jefferson traveled to France in 1784, it opened up a new world of food, 
wine, and architecture to him. He developed an intense interest in the Italian classical architect Palladio. And Jefferson loved Palladio so much that he designed his kitchen areas like a Palladian villa with wings to the left and wings to the right to form a great U-shaped court in the middle. So you can see the house in plan at the top of the screen here and then these two wings uh, with the courtyard in the middle. And so Jefferson did exactly the same thing. This is his house, the house Monticello. He built underground passageways uh, out to the sides and then placed the kitchen areas like the storage areas, the smokehouse and the kitchen in the bottom, the kitchens in the bottom left corner here. And those are built underground into the hill like this. So here we are in one of those underground passageways. See, he built these two underground wings to conceal the kitchen and the pantry and the wine room and connected them with, the, with this passageway. Jefferson located the kitchen separate from the main house in case of fire, but he also did this to keep the enslaved people out of sight from the house. And this is a continuous theme with historical kitchens. The 12 foot by 18 foot kitchen has a clean, no nonsense look. At one end of the kitchen is a large brick fireplace and a wood table in the center is the main prep area. But the pride and joy of this kitchen is a large brick box built to waist height over here on the left. It's Jefferson's stew stove designed with eight openings and a set of cast iron inserts that hold charcoal, a kitchen appliance from France and rare in the United States at the time. The charcoal grates allow the enslaved cooks to control heat under the pans to make delicate sauces called for in French cuisine. And with his battalion of imported French copper pots, Jefferson had his enslaved cooks taught in French cooking. During a Jefferson cooking class, I cooked Jefferson's favorite French dishes, including tomato salads with French vinaigrette. He grew multiple varieties of tomatoes, macaroni and cheese. Um, he served us at a state dinner in 1905 in Washington. It was the hit of the city and ice cream profiteroles. At the beginning of the 1800s, people couldn't believe that they could eat something hot and cold at the same time. Here we are at Campbell House, 1822. So we're moving up in time. This is at University and Queen here in Toronto. In grand mansions in the country, the kitchen like Monticello's would be out in a separate building. But in houses and cities, space was scarce and the kitchen was technically squeezed into the basement. Here we are in the basement at Campbell House with a roaring fireplace, or uh, roaring fire in the fireplace, and these servants would cook in an airless, smoky, gloomy space. And this is kind of a funny photo, but it's really because of all the smoke in the room. Oh, and here are some of these kitchen implements that they had to use uh, in these fireplaces. Here's this crane that swings back and forth with a griddle uh, uh, hanging from it. Here's another griddle. This is actually quite a beautiful griddle. Uh, it has a little spout over on the left and it's got this little ring on top that actually spins. So, in a, you know, in a funny way, it's like contemporary Italian design. It's so beautiful and simple. This is called a spider. It's a long handled uh, frying pan and you would put wood and uh, burning wood and coals underneath to, to fry things. And this is my favorite. This is called the fish roaster. It's like this medieval uh, basket that, uh, that people would put their fish in and move it up to the fire. And the fish roaster in action with a big pot boiling and in the foreground there's uh, salmon fillets on the trivet and a roaster on the left. It's a reflector that roasts uh, things inside it. Here we are at Mackenzie House. This is an excellent example of an 1830s kitchen uh, found in downtown Toronto on Gould Street. The kitchen is also located in the basement. They have high windows here, but it's, it is in the basement. And the big innovation here is the addition of a cast iron stove. And this one has a double oven and multiple burners. So we go from this kind of situation where you have to bend down and it's hot and it's smoky and it's dangerous, this crackling and snapping. And then we get to the stove where the fire is encased in this cast iron uh, uh, box. So by the 1850s, stoves have become common in the kitchens of middle-class homes. 
Technology had remained the same for hundreds of years until the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century, and innovations such as electricity, electrical lighting, plumbing, gas lines were introduced that completely changed the evolution of the kitchen. And stoves like this were a godsend to cooks. They could control the temperature with handles and levers. They could cook more dishes on the stove top, and there was less risk of their clothes catching fire. Oh, and when I was there, we just happened to be there around Christmas. We're going to have some nice apple cider. They had made these nice cookies. There's a gelatin salad back there. And they said oranges were a very big deal in the beginning of the 19th century. They were very rare. So when you had them at Christmas, you ate the orange. But you also kept the peels and you dried them and uh, dipped them in sugar. Here we are at a place called the Glessner House, 1887 in Chicago by an architect named H.H. Richardson, one of my favorite architects. I love H.H. because look at, he's a very broad, handsome, uh, substantial person, and it, uh, he sits there just like his buildings. In the late 19th century, women such as Catherine Beecher and Harriet Beecher Stowe led a kitchen reform movement. With an expanding middle class, there was a new awareness of the kitchen, and they wanted the house to be comfortable, healthy, and efficient for the woman of the house. It was also the beginning of schools of domestic science or home economics to improve efficiency of housework. At the Glessner house, the results were bringing the kitchen from the basement up to the ground floor with bigger windows in the kitchen, increasing sunlight, ventilation, and improving health. The aim was to make the kitchen the cleanest, neatest, most rational place in the house. And here's, here's one of these windows bringing light in, and to the upper left is the enunciator panel. And uh, yep, you'd have to listen to the buzzer and go uh, service Mr. Glessner in the parlor or in the library or in the conservatory. Here's their new gas stove. Um, this combination of the tile on the floor, it's a uh, encaustic tile, ceramic tile, glazed subway tiles on the walls, and either even on the ceiling here, made everything easy to keep clean the Beechers would approve. Here we are at Spadina, Spadina House in 1920. But in, this, in 1894, they put their new kitchen in. And the Austin family uh, put this new kitchen in. I wrote an article in the Toronto Star called Spadina, Toronto's Downton Abbey. And the house is the same 20th century time period as Downton, only in a Toronto setting. Here we are in the parlor and uh, the dining room. These are all designed to impress guests with the owner's power and wealth. And the dining room was designed with these portraits of the family, uh, their lineage, these portraits. Mrs. Austin had a secret button on the floor at her foot. So when the guests needed service, she would just press on the button with her foot and the servants would come out just in time to serve people like magic. The kitchen was brought up from the basement up to the ground level. So this was a big move and part of this kitchen reform movement. The kitchen is light and airy and a positive environment for the servants, but it also helped to keep employees happy and encourage them to stay. So you can see there's battleship linoleum on the floor. But servants continue to be separated from the family by the architecture and the walls of the house. So um, they would have separate kit. They were stuck in the separate kitchen. This, they had their own stairways, hallways, bedrooms, and eating areas. By and large, they're restricted to the basement and to the third floor. This is the ground floor. And you can see over on the left, there's the kitchen and the scullery and the pantry. And that's just about where the servants are going to be restricted. They have their own stairway to go up to their quarters on the third floor or back down to the basement. There's a situation in this house is that um, the palm room is way over here on the right, and the person who takes care of the plants has to get to that room on the ground floor. What that person would have to do is walk through the basement and in the walk through to get to the above uh, uh, the, the palm room, there was a trap door in the floor of the palm room. He would come up the, palm, the, the trap door, water the plants, and then he'd have to go back down the trapdoor and down to the basement and out of the house. 
So people were, the servants were supposed to be completely isolated and invisible. And here I am with, uh, with Ed Lyons. We're, we're baking uh, Christmas cookies here. And in the kitchen, there's all these new prepared foods. Uh, by the 1920s, the Austins were uh, very happy to be, it, uh, to be seen to be innovative and impress their friends with these new prepared foods that they like, like these new potato chips that were uh, considered a health food at the time. Here's the scullery where the lowest person on the totem pole would have to uh, stay here and wash dishes. And if they ever broke any dishes, uh, they'd have to pay for those dishes out of their own uh, wages. And this, the two stoves. The stove on the right is the coal uh, and wood stove. The stove on the left is the new gas stove. So we baked our cookies in this new gas stove. For the first time, cooks could turn a knob and get controlled and immediate heat. No wood or coal necessary. It was miraculous. So this is uh, made by Inglis in Toronto in 1930, and it's called the Miss Toronto model. And here's, here's Ed with our cookies. <laughs> This is Georgia O'Keeffe, 1949 in Abiquiu, New Mexico. In 1949, painter Georgia O'Keeffe moved to New Mexico where she renovated an adobe house and lived a solitary life in the New Mexico mountains. This is her painting depicting the landscape near her house in Abiquiu. I visited and learned that O'Keeffe liked to cook, eat, and garden as much as making art. So this is the landscape around her house it couldn't, she couldn't find a more uh, isolated place, really. This is her adobe house. It looks like something right out of a John Wayne Western movie. And it's built with adobe blocks, flat blocks, and they put a skim coat uh, of uh, adobe mud on the outside. And they get these beautiful curving, undulating lines that I just love on these houses. Look at the top of that parapet curving over the top. Here is her garden in the back. It's, it's a, a, a huge garden of vegetables and fruit trees. And the way it got watered was, it's a very dry area, but up in the mountains, they still had ice and snow and they would have water reservoirs. And at 10 a.m. on Mondays, the water would come rushing down her, these little troughs and flood the garden like a, like a Zamboni. And that would happen once a week. And that's how she watered her garden. Here are some pictures of uh, O'Keeffe in Abiquiu, at, and they're from the uh, Georgia O'Keeffe Museum in Santa Fe. And they're so different from the kinds of photographs of O'Keeffe that we're used to seeing. I used to seeing pictures of O'Keeffe where they're very posed and she's very, looking very uh, uh, severe and um, not smiling. And there's a whole series of these photos in Abiquiu where she's smiling and entertaining and being with people and look at those beautiful beer steins, drinking beer and having the time of her life. When you go to Abiquiu and you go to Santa Fe, I think that you realize that she's having the best time of her life here. When she was in New York, well, she, first of all, she grew up in, in Wisconsin on a farm and then she moved to New York and married, uh, um, what's his name? Anyway, Stieglitz, Stieglitz. And he was an art dealer and she really didn't like all that kind of social life in New York. She wanted to paint. So when, after Stieglitz died, she moved to uh, Abiquiu and you can see she gets to do what she wants. So this is her kitchen, uh, a, a band of white frame windows stretched along one wall of the 12 foot by 16 foot room. The walls are painted white with two adobe colored accent walls that echo rectangular forms in her art. The ceiling of natural wood logs and planking reflects local New Mexico building methods. The kitchen has a light, airy feeling and is bathed in sunlight from the windows. The eating table is a simple flat sheet of plywood supported by sawhorse legs. All the, all the uh, tables in her house are designed like this. She designed them. It's painted with a thin coat of opaque white paint. And you can see in the top right, it's a bare light bulb. The house is lit with bare light bulbs. She didn't like lampshades. There's only one lampshade in the whole house and it's a Noguchi lampshade given to her by Noguchi. So only a, a, a Noguchi lampshade from Noguchi 
is worthy of uh, hanging in Georgia O'Keeffe's house. This is uh, uh, a pantry, her pantry, a 10 foot by 12 foot pantry uh, behind a door in the kitchen. It's a reflection of the big part that food played in her life. So somebody asked a question, mise en place, put in place. So, you know, this is, this is Georgia O'Keeffe's mise en place. And somebody asked, how do you design mise en place in a house? This is a good example. She's a mise en place person. She's very organized. She knows what she wants to do. This is her paint uh, box that's uh, in the uh, Georgia O'Keeffe Museum. Look at all her, her, her tubes of paint neatly put in there, all in little compartments. Her paintbrushes are ready to go. I love the masking tape on the handle. Georgia O'Keeffe's paint box has masking tape on her handle. And this is mise en place, plus just the same as your paint box. Everything's in, uh, neatly in, in, in compartments. On the upper right, uh, there are baskets there that she used to uh, forage the streams. She liked to um, pick wild uh, watercress. And uh, she liked dandelion leaves mixed into her mashed potatoes. Underneath the counter, you can see boxes of um, uh, mason jars. She liked to preserve and pickle, and that's all a part of her uh, upbringing from a farm in Wisconsin. And in the middle of the uh, counter, you can see the uh, cabinet with doors on it and it's locked, and that's where she kept her alcohol, locked. I love this photo because if you see in the middle of the counter, there's an electric frying pan, a silver electric frying pan, and it's the same electric silver frying pan that my mother had. And if my mom knew that she had the same electric frying pan as Georgia O'Keeffe, she would be thrilled. So at a Georgia, I went to a, a Georgia O'Keeffe cooking class and I met O'Keeffe's cook, Margaret Wood. She said, Miss O'Keeffe was a lover of tasty and simple food and she was also a health nut. She was an acquaintance of pioneering nutritionist Adele Davis. Her garden was an extension of her kitchen. So we made O'Keefe recipes, a baked chicken with a slice of lemon underneath the skin in an airline cut with the, with the uh, wing um, the, uh, Frenched. Corn soup, fresh rock corn kernels off the cob. And dessert was Norwegian apple pie cake with rum sauce and O'Keefe favorite. So a number of these recipes are in the book, by the way, this corn soup recipes uh, in, in the book, uh, the Thomas Jefferson vinaigrettes is in the book. We're gonna to go to Kentuck Knob, Mill Run, Pennsylvania, 1958, designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, the mid-century modern kitchen. During the late 1950s and early 60s, America and the USSR were in a race for the moon. The public preoccupation with space spilled over into architecture and design, and everything was made to look light and streamlined. The great American architect, Frank Lloyd Wright, was designing his own version of a mid-century modern kitchen. So he's made a statement here about the importance of the kitchen by placing it at the center of the house. And it's inside, right in those doors, there's a stone tower there, which is a skylight over the kitchen. Inside, red cypress wood cupboards are mounted on the stone walls and match the cabinetry in the rest of the house. He built the house with this stone that's right from the site. Shiny New Age was in vogue in the 1950s, and Wright and Mrs. Hagen went all out. Mrs. Hagen's the client. Kitchen counters are cut at angles to echo the geometric vibe in the rest of the house, and she chose to cover her countertops in stainless steel, which gives a gleaming profile to the counters. I know we've got a question coming up about uh, uh, stainless steel counters. We'll address that then. But the flip down stove burners are the big wow in this kitchen. It's the equivalent of having a disappearing stove. The mid-century modern look was to have clean counters and a pristine look. Designers tended to have appliances fold away and disappear. So these space-saving burners were made by Frigidaire and they still work from 1956. So they flip back into their own casing and disappear. The original 1956 oven manufactured by Westinghouse is similarly faced with stainless steel and it still works. So thanks to Lord Palumbo and his family and the Kentuck Knob staff, 
I made a fashionable mid-century modern dessert, baked Alaska in a Frank Lloyd Wright kitchen, one of the top fun things I've done in my life. And then we make the beta kit Alaska and called in uh, everybody on staff at Kentuck Knob who uh, enjoy that. Welcome to the kitchen of Julia Child, 1962, Cambridge, Massachusetts, America's most famous chef. So she donated her kitchen to the uh, um, Smithsonian Institute uh, in Washington, D.C. with all the cabinets and appliances. Anybody can go to see this fabulous exhibition. At first glance, Julia Child's kitchen is mass confusion. The walls are covered by beaters, ladles, spatulas hanging off pegboard. It reminded me a lot of my mom's kitchen. But gradually, the longer I look, the more it all makes sense. The countless knives and forks are neatly collected in canisters in one corner. Measuring cups hang next to the counter for baking duty. That's her baking area over there on the left. You can see that she's got the mixer there. Everything's ready to go. She's ready to go. This, is, this station is set up. Um, and um, multiple frying pans hang within reach of the big black stove. That's her stove, big garland that she loved. In this view, you can see right to the back and you can see her black refrigerator and her refrigerator has all these fridge magnets on it. Just, you know, ordinary fridge magnets, just like everybody else has. On top of the fridge, she's got a cat teapot cozy and she has pictures of cats in her kitchen. And this is her stove again with the, uh, you can see the, uh, on top, uh, there are these canisters labeled with masking tape and magic marker that says spatulas or spoons. The most dominant feature of the kitchen is the vast number of pots and pans hanging in the kitchen. They're meticulously hung on the pegboard covered walls. There's an underlying orderliness to the kitchen. Each pot is hung in a specific place outlined in black marker on the pegboard. At the center of the 14 foot by 20 foot kitchen is a modest wood table covered in a yellow Mary Meko tablecloth. She and her husband ate their meals here. You can see in between the windows, she's got these swivel lights that turn around so she didn't want any uh, shadows on her counter. And she's got her knives on these magnetic holders in graduated order. It's very well organized, very well organized. She uses every inch. And then I came back, I was so inspired by the kitchen. I came back and met my friend, David Lillico, who's a Julie Child disciple. We met, made her uh, cheese souffle. It's also in the book, the recipe. In the middle here, you can see the souffle pot covered in cheese. The outside is foil, it's tied up. This is the, the, the bechamel sauce in, the, in uh, yellow with the egg white uh, being folded in gradually. We're adding cheese. And here's the final product, the beautiful cheese souffle. It's not easy, it's not easy making this, but it's really delicious. Here's the house of Louis and Lucille Armstrong, 1970 in Queens, New York. So Louis Armstrong and his wife, Lucille, lived in this modest Queens, New York house. And Louis loved his house and he loved his street. Oh, here they are together. Louis loved his street and the kids on the street. So when he sings in What a Wonderful World, I hear babies cry, I watch them grow. They'll learn much more than I'll ever know. He's singing about his street and he, he really uh, loved his street. And Lucille, Lucille loved her curvy turquoise kitchen with wallpaper. So these images come from the Louis Armstrong Museum. In the 1970s, kitchens were characterized by bright colors and Lucille had her kitchen cupboards in bright turquoise, her favorite color to match her turquoise Cadillac. In 1970, turquoise was a popular color deriving from the Navajo turquoise jewelry from the Southwest. And Lucille did all the cooking and she made Lu Louis' favorite dish, red beans and rice on her custom built double oven stove. Wouldn't you love to have this? And this is Graceland, Memphis, Tennessee, Elvis Presley, 1977. From a distance, Graceland appears as a quiet two-story house at the top of a hill. Elvis, Priscilla, and Lisa Marie lived here. And Lisa Marie still owns the house. But inside, all the preconceptions of a quiet conservative house disappears. The interior is like the white rhinestone jumpsuits Elvis wore on stage. And the kitchen says, welcome to 1977. I was all shook up. The first thing that hits you is the vast amount of color. 
a collage of wood cabinets, pattern carpet, and the ultra bright colors of the lampshades and appliances. Nothing matches. Flower power and disco dancing was in and set a trend of colorful pants, shirts, and vests that also made their way into house interiors. The center is a U-shaped counter of white formica speckled with gold glitter. Dark wood cabinets wrap around the room. There's an avocado sink, an avocado green dishwasher, and, and coffee maker. Mismatching is most evident on the floor with the wall-to-wall -wall kitchen carpet. <laughs> the appliance wall has a harvest gold refrigerator and electric stovetop. And here's the skillet on the stove. You can just picture Mary Jenkins, who's cook, making peanut butter and banana sandwiches. Oh, and I came back and had a Elvis uh, birthday party, made his meatloaf. It's hamburger mixed with saltine crackers, and the topping is tomato sauce and ketchup. And you sort of wonder, how's this going to taste? But it was pretty good. It was pretty good. Uh, he loved his meatloaf. And of course, we also had the peanut butter and banana sandwiches. Seeing the Harvest Gold Fridge was like seeing an old friend. <laughs> While in the 70s, kitchens were an explosion of color, in the 80s and 90s, homeowners began to tire of the color and went the opposite way and turned to a minimalist white kitchen. But the 70s was also the beginning of the open concept kitchen, as the kitchen slowly opened up to the rest of the house. With greater equality of the sexes in the 70s, entire families, men and children, not just women, began to cook. In conclusion, today's kitchen is the center of the house. It's the great room of the house. Instead of welcoming guests into the living room, the kitchen is where we gather with friends. This is a new house on Vancouver Island in the Pacific Northwest. You enter the house through the low vestibule down here at the bottom. You turn a corner and bam, you're nearly bowled over by a spectacular view of the ocean and the mountains. That's Washington State in the distance. The entire main level is one open concept room and the kitchen is the centerpiece. The dining room, living room, family room walls have disappeared. The kitchen ensemble of cabinets and stove and oven and central island measures about 12 feet by 15 feet, but it feels much larger due to the openness to the rest of the house and the views. And I got to cook in this kitchen and we made a stir fry with BC spot prawns that were just caught that morning 30 feet off the shore and uh, greens from the, uh, the garden for the salad, wasabi greens, fabulous. And what happens in this kitchen is the kitchen spreads out to the rest of the house and then it spreads out to the garden and it spreads out to the mountains and the ocean. So just some kitchen trends to watch for, slab backsplashes. Uh, this is another trend. This is Jennifer Siegel's house in Venice, California. She's an architect. The slabs are taking over with upper cabinets on their way out, the owners are left with more wall space. Dining table attached to the island. As the dining room disappears, this is the trend. And kitchen islands become the focal point of the house. And they're larger, single level, and it's meant to create an impact. So everything happens in this kitchen. When I came to visit, that's where the meeting was. You can see I got my chair pulled out right behind me, just to the left is her daughter's uh, play area with the toys. So everything happens in the kitchen. Oh, and somebody asked a question about immigrant kitchens, new immigrants. These are something called, uh, these are on the West Coast in Vancouver. They're spice kitchens. So these are kitchens within a kitchen. And they're uh, largely used by people who are Chinese or Indian. And the idea is to isolate the smells. So you do your cook cooking in there and, and uh, shut the doors. And actually, you know, that's not that much different from the way uh, historical kitchens work. Like, the, the kitchen at uh, Spadina is separated by the butler's pantry to keep out the noise and the smells. Finally, smart kitchens. Today, you can have a kitchen with technology integrated into every appliance and controlled by your phone. So Whirlpool has an oven with, that, with a window that doubles as a screen. You can see what's roasting inside without opening the oven door. Fridge, the fridge is where it's happening though. The fridge can track groceries as you put them inside, record the best before dates, and track consumption. So Samsung has a fridge that comes with a camera app that lets you check on the contents inside your, inside your fridge on your phone while you're pushing your shopping cart at the grocery store. So you think, what kind of yogurt did I want to get? Oh, it's right here. Oh yeah, I can. So you can share this information 
in your fridge with your grocery store and they can track your consumption and even send you more milk if they think you're getting low. But you should also, also beware that that kind of information uh, will be shared and uh, with advertisers and marketers. Oh, here's the front of the fridge. You can punch in your grocery store if you want to get something and another person looking inside the fridge with her phone. Here's my kitchen right now. I'm ready to go. I want to get some shelving over here on the right where there's a blank space. We never did finish this kitchen. There's, I want to get a cart with a butcher block to be a movable uh, island. I'm going to get a second oven, uh, a smaller oven, and we got to get a backsplash for uh, um, this. And may maybe it will be like those white subway tiles at the Glessner house. My advice, make it your happy place. The kitchen will continue to be the most important room in the house and more. As life becomes more go, 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 and family members become increasingly isolated in their private rooms with their own TVs, cell phones, and computers, the space where we come together for a shared meal will become more treasured. Cooking, eating with friends are possibly the greatest pleasures in life, wouldn't you say? And the sight of it all is the kitchen. It doesn't have to look like it's out of a design magazine. Julia Child's kitchen was cluttered, but she loved her kitchen. It's the kitchen of a person who loved to cook. I hope that you love your kitchen, and I hope you love to cook in it. And the last word goes to who else? It's certainly the most loved and most used room in the house. Julia Child, bon appetit. Thank you very much for being here tonight. It was so nice to meet you. Again, if you want to buy the book, it's at penguinrandomhouse.ca. And here's my email address, roota at rogers.com. I'd love to hear from you. And even if it's a couple of weeks from now, send me an email. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, John. Um, we're going to start the Q&A with uh, some curated questions. Um, and um, I think the first one, perhaps, is one that I had uh, uh, wondered as well. You showed us some um, images of your kitchen, but do you want to give us a sense of what went into the logic of its design? Yes. So we built our own house, and I always wanted to have the kitchen in the front. You know, when I, when I went to the University of British Columbia, I, I worked on a thesis with, um, on uh, native houses. And um, when you walk into a house uh, in British Columbia with native people, they, they come in the back door and they come into the kitchen and you get somebody to eat right away or a cup of coffee and you sit down and you do your conversing in the kitchen. So I always really liked that idea. So if you come into my house, you come in with the kitchen at the front, get a cup of coffee, get something to eat, and we're just gonna chat. So the kitchen's at the front. The front of the uh, kitchen is a big window. I love doing the dishes there. I love doing cleaning things. And I wave to the neighbors as they walk by. And sometimes, you know, when people walk by and they don't really like the contemporary look of the house, I feel like I'm some sort of advocate for uh, modern architecture. So I wave to them. I, you know, if they don't, you know, they wave back. I say, come on in, come on in. You know, so I'm very social. It's very social. So I love that part of the kitchen, but it also takes up a fair amount of wall space. So I want to get over on that one wall over here. Uh, some open shelving so that we uh, start using every inch of the kitchen, just like Julia Child. I want to get that magnetic uh, knife holder going just like Julia and, uh, ah, and, and, and different things uh, that I learned uh, from, uh, from uh, this journey. You know, Frank Lloyd Wright was great to bring nature into the house. So certainly those shelves are going to be natural wood. And I love, I love the way he, you know, you could see in that house, he built he built it with stone from the site and the same kind of wood. And, and so that, and he, what he does is with that house is he brings the stone out on the patio straight through into the house and into the kitchen. It's all the same stone and it's seamless. It, there's not even, there's not even a, 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 a plinth there. So uh, it's those kinds of things that I want to do. It sounds like from the, that you, in a sense, you internalized some of the best, let's say, lessons or uh, examples from the various kitchens you looked at before you did your own. I'm going to flip the question around. Um, were there things you saw in some of the kitchens that became object lessons in what not to do? 
Um, you know, I, I wasn't looking at it that way. <laughs> uh, I was looking for the positive things. Uh, I was mostly looking for things that I really liked about them. Is there anything that I didn't like? Oh, I know, in, the, in that Kentuck Knob uh, uh, kitchen, it's a very funny story. So it's, there's no windows in it. You could see the tower on the outside of the house, and it's a skylight that comes down. So this is, this is Frank Lloyd Wright's idea. It's his idea. It's not Mrs. Hagen's idea. So it would get very hot in there. And Frank Lloyd Wright in that house is hilarious because he's so egotistical. So she got hot from that skylight and she put a screen over it to sort of diffuse the light and, there, and he had something else up there. He got really mad. He said it, it, it ruined his design. And uh, so I think uh, a big skylight like that is not a good idea because it does heat up that, uh, that kitchen. He was hilarious on that, in that house. He said the height of a, per the perfect height for a human being is five foot six, which is what he was. So he designed the whole house around a five foot six module. And so uh, that, if that's not egotistical enough, <laughs> not even talking about the, the client, the clients had a son who was six foot two. <laughs> so the client said to him, would you mind uh, uh, making the ceilings a little bit higher for our son? <laughs> he said, oh, all right. <laughs> if I must. <laughs> There's lots of stories about him like that at that house. Now I noticed, <laughs> and while the presentation was going on, I kept saying that <laughs> Why did they let him cook all the time? Like, did you have an arrangement with these various places or was this typical no. in a lot of them that you would be allowed to? Uh, oh, oh, well, some of them, I, I, I it, was like, it was a combination of places that I, I always wanted to go to. It was a combination of places that uh, famous people that I wanted to get, learn more about. But also they were places where I knew I could, like they had a kitchen and, and not all of them operated, but I knew we could operate them somehow. But it, but, and so, but wait a minute, but if, if it's just any one of us went into these places, would they let us be you know, whipping you know, up it's, a it's sort of, it, You know, I, I, was very, I was very excited when I got there. I and bet. so I went to a place in New Orleans, and I, I, this happened a lot. I typed them up, I say I'm coming, I want to cook. No reply. No reply. And then I sent another one. No reply. So in New Orleans, I just said, you know what? I'm going. I got to cook there. And what's the worst that's going to happen? I'm going to have a great weekend in New Orleans by myself. So what? So I go there. I knock on the door. I say, hi, I'm the guy who wants to cook. And they go, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, OK, come on. <laughs> and that's really what happened. And, and because, you know, I mean, if somebody wants to cook and eat, and they're interested, yeah, come on in. What the heck? So was your, was your interest in kitchens born out of uh, the fact that you love cooking? Uh, or was it that you thought it was the architectural center of the home? I mean, which? I always loved the kitchen and I loved it architecturally. Um, earlier in my life, I had to um, uh, measure mansions and I'd have to measure the whole mansion. And I measure the parlor and the dining room. And I don't know, this is okay, you know, because they, they're just designed to impress people with power and money. And when I got to the kitchen, I always liked the kitchen the best. It was clean and austere and utilitarian and clean walls. There was none of this business about trying to put on a false front. And it's the place where people cook and the place where people eat. And I always loved the kitchens in those mansions. And I like to cook and I like to eat. So um, I, I always thought, you know, nobody's really writing about the kitchen. People, people who like historical houses like the parlor or the conservatory, <laughs> I like the kitchen. I love, and, I love the way you <laughs> say it, like, uh, the conservatory. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, it's true, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, it, it, the kitchen's just genuine, right? It's more informal. You're not trying to impress anybody. It's the place where people cook and eat. And I like to eat. But, so it was a calling. Yeah. I just thought I had to that, do it. Do you think that's shifted now? I mean, partly because people are spending so much more time in their kitchens, but also because there is a way in which the kitchen can be, can be a show off, even if it is austere. Because that's exactly right. Yes. So on the one hand, 
somebody's written a, a question here about, about the kitchen. Why, why do people like it? Because it's more informal. There doesn't have that, you know, the oh so important first editions in the bookshelf or the group of seven paintings on the wall. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, you know, you can feel, you know, you, you sit in the sofa, you feel kind of uncomfortable. In the kitchen, it's informal. You know, if you spill your wine, you got the paper towel there, you wipe it up, no problem. You go there, eat little things, you know. So, but at the same time, with the new emphasis on the kitchen, the island is the status symbol. Come on in, come on over. I got to show you my fabulous new island. It's got a new oven in it. It's got double sink. It's got this, it's got that. And that's the new status symbol. And it's great. I mean, it, I mean, at least you're sharing your status symbol with your friends and feeding them, which is great. I mean, the status symbol used to be parking your BMW out on the driveway. Right? That's how you showed your, your status or your wealth. Now you bring people in and show them your new kitchen. It's, you know, kitchens are really big and, um, uh, and you've got the latest gadgets in your island like that, that new thing that, that you grow uh, chives and, and, and herbs in, you know, that refrigerator thing. So you get all the new gadgets in your kitchen. That's the new status symbol. Right, so one of the questions that has just come in was a question about whether in fact this, uh, let's say elevated status of the island is, is maybe diminishing the functionality of the island. If it's being asked to, to oh. do too much in effect. <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends. I, I get the question. I think it depends if you like to cook. And some people, they have beautiful kitchens, but they don't cook. It's more of a, you know, it, it is a status, it's a fashion statement or it's a, a real estate uh, thing to uh, make the house more valuable. But if you like to cook, I think that, that um, getting these great things in the island is a good thing. And if you make use of them, then, then I think there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's great. Um, I'm on this thing right now because I have a smaller kitchen where um, I'm trying to minimize all our stuff. And I think that on top of using every single inch in a kitchen, sort of pare down everything that you had. So I, in the book, I did a, I did a uh, chapter on the tenement kitchen, which is a tiny kitchen. And they don't have very many implements in the kitchen. It's very, and they used it for multiple things. And it was a sweatshop kitchen. So they had irons on the stove. Uh, they did their laundry washing. They had to cut dresses and things in there. They have very minimal uh, utensils. And I, I find in, 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 with our kitchens these days, we've got utensils upon utensils and you never even use them, but you've got them in your drawer. And we even have a, an avocado pitter. So I can, all you need is a paring knife. That's an avocado pitter. You know, so, so it, I think you have to pare down uh, your possessions so just to make it more uh, efficient. Yeah. yeah. Um, so someone has asked, uh, again, in a recent question, whether you think that uh, with the current pandemic and if this extends itself, whether that might affect the way kitchens are designed just because they are such social places? Yes. Um, one of the things that we're going to do with our kitchen is uh, that stainless steel countertop. So uh, I know that there was a question that was sent in uh, the pros and cons of a uh, stainless steel countertop. So we're going with that and I'm really inspired by that Frank Lloyd Wright kitchen. It's because Mrs. Hagen, they ran a dairy. So she knew everything good about uh, stainless steel uh, countertops. So it's very sanitary. That's the, that's the best thing. And you can wipe it down and it's not completely non-porous and, um, and indestructible indestructible you i mean it, it, we've got uh, a formica thing now and it gets scratched and cut and everything like with uh, stainless steel it's it'll get scratched but that forms part of the patina the uh so uh, those are the positive things about the stainless steel countertop that we like is that it's going to be so sanitary and resistant to germs um the downsides to that are it's it's noisy when you hit put something down it'll make a noise but, um, and then I'm, um, I'm so sorry. I'm such a sucker for the look too. I mean, it just gets that nice gleaming silver horizontal thing happening in, in the kitchen. So doesn't but, it, uh, I don't, I mean, I've noticed this with some appliances. Uh, how do you avoid it not being smudged all the time? Oh, you just have to keep wiping it down. That's, <laughs> that, that's all. 
<laughs> well, I think the question asker was contemplating doing that for her kitchen. So you, right. So I'm going to do it. I'm doing it. Yeah. Uh, and and some some of the other things. Uh, I I love the uh, the subway tiles, the wipe down. I mean, um, it's just not the Glessner House. It's the Gamble House in Pasadena. Uh, lots of houses that I've seen in 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 that period use these subway tiles, and it's really good for just wiping things down. And and also the look is so good. It's just classic. And yeah. even the, the first slide, one of the first slides that I showed in the contemporary kitchen, it's subway tiles. And it's, it's, a, it's a look that, that never goes away. And I actually see it a little bit like shoji screens, these, these re, this rectangular aesthetic. So um, yeah, I like, I, uh, I, we're gonna go with that. Okay. Yeah. Um, what do you think about um, the, well, I guess two part question. What do you think about this trend of outdoor kitchens? Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, sort of creating almost a parallel room for outdoor living. So you don't even have to go inside. You can do the cooking and whatever outside. But then also whether that has, you know, is this a, a new phenomenon or does it actually relate back to traditions of exterior um, cooking? Yes. So, the, yes. So historically, people always did have a summer kitchen and they, they would take, a, they would actually take apart the stove and yeah. <laughs> outside and, <laughs> well, and that's just to um, make sure that the house doesn't get heated up. So that's, that's great. And um, um, I, think, I think that's a great trend to, to be closer to nature, to be closer to your kitchen garden, and to enjoy the outdoors is, uh, is wonderful. So I think, I think that's, that's great. Um, um, oddly enough, those, those fold down uh, stove tops. Oops. Here we go. I just disappeared there for a minute. Oh, you're, you're showing on my screen. Is that right? Well, I'll keep talking because uh, my screen has disappeared. Um, but uh, those little fold down uh, stove units were detachable. They could unplug and you could take those out to your patio and plug them back in on your patio and keep your barbecue sauce warm. So that would all, those would have been perfect for uh, an outdoor, uh, uh, kitchen. Yeah. It seems like the kitchen is a room that is much more, let's say, affected by technological development, simply because yeah. it's the most appliance heavy or intensive room in the house. And uh, one person has just asked about, uh, she gives a specific, uh, sorry, the specific example of the microwave and the degree to which the microwave, which I believe when they were introduced were quite big. I mean, they were, you know, yeah. they were the size of a television set. Um, <laughs> And whether, to what degree, I guess I'm broadening the question a bit, to what degree the introduction of new technology and the changes in technology actually affect both the aesthetic and the design logic of kitchens? You know, I, I've been thinking about that and it's, I, I hate to say, it, it's mostly about what people are gonna sell you. And um, I think there are all kinds of uh, little appliances and um, uh, knickknacks and things that that people think up so that they can make money and try and sell you to add to your kitchen. And um, it's happening now, but it also happened back in the 1950s because I've, I've done some research um, like going through newspapers and some of the things that they were trying to sell uh, housewives to uh, improve their kitchens. There were all kinds of crazy things. There, I, I saw a table, uh, a kitchen table, and the base of the table was a refrigerator. So you would sit at the dinner table and you could, you could open the refrigerator and get the milk right at, at your uh, kitchen table. So there are always people who are trying to come up with uh, new, new inventions so that they can uh, sell, sell them to you and, and uh, make money from their appliance. And I was thinking also that the advent, I don't know, I know you mentioned it in a couple of the homes, but I don't know exactly when they were introduced, but these so-called appliance garages, which I know were very popular in the 80s and 90s, um, you know, they're in some ways they're to make the kitchen look more streamlined, but they're also obviously a response to having a proliferation of appliances, which are too big to actually just be yes. away. They have to be hidden. Yeah. So I, in the last, uh, uh, um, British Columbia kitchen, they have an uh, appliance garage and uh, they put all their uh, cell phones in there and recharge in there. 
<laughs> well, it's actually it's actually quite handy. It's actually quite good. <laughs> So someone was wondering in the in the current list of questions, and I'm I'm kind of favoring these because they're new to me. Um, yeah. so, but I will return to some of the ones that were um, put in beforehand. But uh, they wondered in terms of the kitchens you looked at, um, if if there was one or two that you really finally kind of favored uh, because they. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, cold. I like them all. I like them all for different reasons. But uh, the Julia Child kitchen mm. really uh, affected me. It, yeah. First of all, it, it reminded me so much of my mom's kitchen, but it really changed my attitude about the kitchen and interior design of the whole house. Not everything has to be put away. Not everything has to be perfect. So I'm a modernist. Um, I'm a minimalist. And I always wanted and uh, aspired to that clean, austere uh, look, clean counters. But I like to cook. Yeah. And I think that when uh, Julia has her things close at hand, within a two foot reach and organized in, 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 in areas like the, the baking area and the stove area and the salad area, it just makes cooking uh, so much easier and enjoyable. So that you're not running around looking for a knife in your drawer, it's already up on that magnetic uh, holder. Um, so if things are out, um, it just makes cooking uh, much more fun. And that completely changed my look at kitchens um, and, and um, the way kitchens look today. I had a, a magazine of 25 kitchens in it and they were all staged and they all looked the same. <laughs> they're all, they're all kind of white and austere. And in the, in the pictures, there are no people, there are no spoons, there are no pots, there are no, no tomatoes, no food. So, so what is this? You know, I mean, it, it's, it, it, I think that those kinds of photos and that kind of thinking, well, if it works for you, that's great. I, I don't want to offend anybody and their kitchen. But, you know, that puts a lot of pressure on people if they're not perfect. And, um, I, I, that, you know, and so uh, I think it's all right to have things out. Uh, but for, is, me, for me, cooking is love. Cooking yeah. is love, you know, and, and when I made this matzo ball soup with my friend Annie Lewis in New York, when she was making the matzo ball soup, she was talking about how it reminded her of her grandmother, it was her grandmother's recipe, and her mother and father who are gone, and her cousin sitting around uh, joking and telling stories, and she wanted to put that same love into the soup that night. And I, that's what I think it, cooking is about. You know, it's about eating and enjoying, but it's also about taking care of people and making dinner. Like I make dinner for my wife. You know, I, I want to give her the best things, the best piece of meat. I want to make sure that she gets the best lettuce, in, you know, cause I love her. So that's, you know, that's what cooking is about. It's sometimes I think we get, we get carried away with the staging and the look and the fashion. So, so picking up on that, one of the questions was, and there's so many questions now, um, <laughs> whether, uh, whether you believe that there will be a kind of a reversion almost to a more primitive style of kitchen to almost, you could say, as a kind of um, reaction to this overly austere modern look that is prevalent. Uh, whether there might be, you know, more organic looking kitchens that will come about as a, again, as a reaction to that tendency. Yes, I, I can only see for myself that, that in my kitchen, I want to make it more natural. I want it to be, to have a better connection to nature. And I think that that uh, leads to a more holistic life so that the food that you eat is more natural, uh, more organic. And then your house becomes more uh, natural too, with natural materials and leading a more healthy lifestyle. So I, I, would, uh, I, would, I, would, I would think that would happen and I would hope that that would happen. And, and with things out and, and you know, things less severe. And um, what, one of the things that happens with the kitchen now with these open concept uh, houses is that the materials in the kitchen the wood cupboards match the materials in the, in the living area and in the eating area so that the whole place becomes one and uh, just in the look and in the materials. And I think uh, that's, that's certainly already happening because you want, you want the whole uh, open concept area to, to look coordinated and healthy and natural. Yeah. So there's two questions that the, these are quite, um, 
one was a pre-arranged question, the other one has just come up, but they both take us a little bit outside of the field of the domestic kitchen, but they, they interested me for different reasons. So I'm gonna ask them, this is the power of the moderator. <laughs> um, so the one is what you think about uh, industrial kitchens or let's say non-domestic kitchens. So if you think about restaurants, because some restaurants hide their kitchens away, yeah. And they're, you know, they're uber organized, which you yeah. could say they have to be if they have to produce food and a quick order for many people. But other, other restaurants put their kitchens on display such that you're, you know, the restaurant is formed yeah. around that open kitchen. And so just do you have any thoughts about uh, sort of the logic of how kitchens are presented or used in uh, non-domestic settings? Yes. Well, the open kitchen out and being the center of the restaurant, I love because I love kitchens. And I, I try to sit as close as I can to the kitchen so I can see what everybody's cooking. I think that also uh, is a result of, you know, that gives the, uh, the customers uh, faith that they're, uh, they're cooking in a, in a clean environment and, um, uh, uh, and it's, it's sanitary and everything's out in the open. But I love to see people cooking. And uh, yeah, I think that's great. What you were saying about small kitchens and restaurants, I was thinking about today, you know, because somebody told me, you know, a common thing that people say to me is, you know, condos are getting smaller. I mean, and smaller. And the kitchens in the condos are getting smaller and smaller. And, and some people say to me, uh, don't you think people are going to stop cooking because the, the kitchens are getting so small? Well, I'm very sympathetic to that. I think it's, it's, it's um, uh, you know, more difficult to cook in a small kitchen. But, you know, some of the restaurants, and I've designed them, actually, with like a, a 60 person maximum restaurant and the billing code that that's a the 60 person is a, is a, is a line. They have very small kitchens um, and uh, smaller, smaller than my kitchen, but they're cooking for, for 60 people. And the thing with those kitchens is they are very well organized. And in some ways those kitchens, uh, it's an advantage to have a, uh, uh, if they've got the right proportions in the floor plan, so they can move back and forth and they can move around and, and it could be more efficient. So I think the key with those small restaurant kitchens is just like Julia's kitchen. They use every inch and it's really planned out and, and they've got their stations organized. Right. right. And uh, you know, there's a great, I was reading today, there's a, a great piece in Anthony Bourdain's Kitchen Confidential on, uh, I think it's page, yeah, 213 here. And he writes, he doesn't, he writes about, it's called, he says, on my station. And he writes about how, when he comes in in the morning, what he does for the restaurant and how he sets up his station. And he's got everything organized and he's thinking about what's gonna happen all day and how this burner is gonna be used here, that burner is gonna be used there. And they're gonna use this to boil water for the ravioli. So he's got everything figured out. And I think that, and I'm very sympathetic to people with small kitchens, but I think if you've got a small kitchen, that's part of the strategy and the way of dealing with, with life in, the, in your small kitchen is, unfortunately, you have to be very organized. You have to get your station figured out. You have to do a lot more planning. And um, so, so, so cheers to you <laughs> in, in, in getting that, uh, uh, that organized in your small kitchen. And, and maybe, I don't know, it might be helpful just to remember that people work in small kitchens and they're serving 60 people at a time. Yeah. I don't know if you ever ate in the uh, restaurant in Yorkville called Chabrol, but it had one of the tiniest kitchens I've ever seen because the whole <laughs> restaurant only held about, um, I think the inside anyway, only held about a dozen people. Yeah. And the restaurant was about the size of half an island. I mean, the, the kitchen was about half the size of half an island. And the degree of organization that was required yes. to deliver that food uh, was, that was as interesting as eating the food, really. Yeah. See how it was done. So the other question was about um, cooking shows. Oh, and yes. The way that, you know, the, I think the old model, if you think about Julia Child, Graham Carroll, people like that, was to, you know, the set was set up so that you were being invited into, you know, an ersatz home. Uh, to see food being prepared. But now th with this tendency towards cooking competitions, in some ways the kitchen it has been almost displaced uh, by instead just sort of like mini stations. Right? Yes. Um, 
So what do you think about the, you know, just the yeah. sort of the representation of kitchens in relation to the tendencies of how cooking is being represented oftentimes uh, on television? You know, I, uh, I like Mary Berg um, and uh, I really like her show. I like her as a person. Um, what I found really fascinating in this pandemic is that she does her cooking now in her own kitchen at yeah. home. I don't know if you've seen that, but I actually like her kitchen at home. And, uh, um, oh, I hope Mary doesn't get mad at me, but, but um, when you see her cooking on TV, it's a staged set, right? It's a TV set. It's yeah. not really a kitchen. I mean, it's a kitchen for a TV show. I really like it when I see her at home cooking. It's like the camera angles are not perfect. <laughs> uh, the lighting's not perfect. And sometimes she disappears off the screen, but it's so much fun. It's so much more genuine to see her cooking and being herself at home. So um, that's one observation uh, that I've had. Um, and on cooking shows these days, I, um, I talked to a TV producer recently because I was actually thinking about uh, this book that I have. And uh, it was quite eye-opening because he said that what they want for television now is what he called character-based television, character-based stories. So it's really about the people that are in the show. And so if you're having a cooking show and they have these competitions now, it's not really about the food right. for the people who produce the TV show. It's about the people and how they're panicking. Once they get these three ingredients, what are you going to do with it? It's real, the show really focuses on those people that are cooking and if they start crying, they start laughing, they start running around. That's what the show is about. The food is just a vehicle. And that's the way that these shows and, and the mentality uh, and the philosophy of making these shows now, it's really about uh, the, the character based uh, show. So, okay. so that's what happens. The food, the food is really secondary, <laughs> you know. It's really about these people running around and trying to get into their, their fridge. And, and so, yeah, the way that they, they've got this, these kitchens set up on TV is that they want them to be running around uh, yeah. because there's more action. It's not really about the food. It's about the action. Yeah. So there's a focus in the uh, book, I'm assuming also in your presentation on North American kitchens. Yes. And I'm just wondering if you, uh, you know, how much exposure you've had to kitchens outside of North America. Uh, not just Europe, but obviously a bit Asia and Africa, um, South America. And, and if you noticed any, uh, if you have observed those kitchens to any degree, if there's any kind of signal differences uh, between those kitchens and the ones in North America. Yes, I have, I have not had uh, as much experience as I would love to have with kitchens in other countries. I've been to kitchens in Japan and England and Italy. What I find is that uh, those are much smaller, much more modest kitchens. Of course, in Japan, they're, they're almost like, uh, compared to North American kitchens, they're almost like toy kitchens. And, uh, you know, you can just go to Muji and see what kinds of appliances they use. Uh, and in England, I mean, my goodness, they have, they, they use their appliances forever. They, they just, it seems they don't, a lot of places, they never renovate their kitchen. And in North America, my goodness, we, we renovate our kitchens every five years. So no doubt about it, in North America, Canada, the United States, we have the biggest, baddest, uh, most, uh, you know, greatest kitchens uh, than anyone in the whole world, really. And I think it's a result of our, uh, you know, our, our economy and our, our, our real estate situation, too. Okay, so we're going to do some lightning round questions now, because um, we're, we're getting near the end. Uh, so, um, favorite kind of fridge refrigerator? Oh, yeah, yeah, I saw that question. You know, I'm not very good on modern refrigerators. Uh, <clears throat> we have a Gen Air. I like the freezer in the bottom, of course, because the, the cold goes down. Uh, it's fine. It's fine. I, I love having the ice machine. There's nothing better than like, I like having the ice machine. Uh, you know, fridges now are, are less deep. So you can't get as much in, but a funny thing uh, when we had a when we had our uh, fridge on the blank, we got the repairman in. He said, 
Um, the best fridges are the old fridges. And if you can find the uh, parts to keep your old fridge working, that's gonna last for a long time. And our fridge breaks down, you know, after six or seven years. Look at those appliances in uh, Kentucknop with the Frigidaire uh, stove tops and the oven. They were put in there in 1956 and they still work. So um, I, uh, my, my grandmother had a, um, a Calvinator from 1928 and it was still operating when she died. <laughs> Which was which was so, which was 1990. <laughs> oh my God! She got her money's worth. She doesn't owe anybody any money on that. Uh, so I'm not very helpful on uh, suggesting the best fridge, but um, yeah, shop around. But um, yeah, uh, th yeah, they just don't make them like they used to. Do you think? Um, do you think that um, there would there's going to be any kind of tendency toward more specialized kitchens in the sense of uh, kitchen, like you talked about the spice kitchen, um, but also maybe kitchens that are geared towards a particular kind of either cuisine preference or cooking style. So if you think about, for example, vegetarians, yeah. they don't ever have meat. So there's certain things they don't need in their um, kitchen repertoire, you could say. Oh, yeah. I never thought of that. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, let me think about that for a while. Um, I do think that... Um, Going back to the little condo kitchen yep. and people s predicting that cooking is going to stop. I don't think cooking is ever going to stop. They're always going to be a kitchen and it might come in different forms, just like you just mentioned, which is a really good point. Uh, but people are always going to keep cooking in their kitchen, mostly because um, health, health is a big deal. Health, like I, I'm, I'm completely obsessed with my health. And so to get healthy food, we have to make that at home. And also there's the, the issue of expense. It's much cheaper to eat at home, to buy groceries and eat at home. So uh, you, know, you can see during this pandemic that people are loving cooking. I don't know if you looked at your Instagram lately, but it's just, mine is just uh, filled with images of people cooking and making fabulous meals. Absolutely. And it's almost like a fashion show. It's everybody's, <laughs> everybody's um, showing off. Right. about well, how they're cooking and we yeah. have more time and we yeah. have more time with our, uh, with our, our, uh, the people in our families. Yeah. So yeah. I think also, I think that's especially led to the resurgence in baking because baking yes. is a time intensive endeavor. And I know my daughter took up bread baking and with sourdough oh. and she's gotten extremely good at it. And the joke was when my, my wife was trying to buy those um, woven baskets that you use for bread making, I don't, they have a yeah. name, but it's it's like Panettone, but I know it's not Panettone. Um, but at any rate, um, and she couldn't get one. They were totally sold out in the city because everyone was <laughs> had bought them all up. That's right. That's right. That's right. My spouse went looking for yeast, and she asked the manager, and it was almost like he it was illegal drugs. He, said, <laughs> he went to the back. He goes, "All right, I'm going to give you one, but I can only give you one." <laughs> All right, so we're almost out of time because I've decided just arbitrarily we're going to stop at 8.30. Uh, I was going to say because we don't want to wear you out, but I think that's impossible. No, um, that, I, I can talk about kitchens all day, <laughs> all night. Uh, the last two questions um, are, uh, the first is, would you consider writing a book on any other room in the house or is your passion for kitchens so you know, intense that this would be the only topic that you would really want to explore well, in terms of a room. I, I don't Obviously know if you're not I writing one on an observatory. No, but I am, I am not quite honestly exploring dining rooms right now. Huh? And I think that dining rooms are a very not understood room. And, um, you know, when I was a kid, I grew up at Bloor and Dufferin in a house that was built in 1910. You know, there are hundreds and thousands of these, the same house. The dining room took up about 40% of the floor plate on the ground floor. And I never could figure out why it was so big. And there are probably other people out there who know what I'm talking about. And you just go, where did this room come from? Why is it so big? And uh, there's a story to it. And there's a reason for that. Um, and it does have to do with dining rooms came late to North America. Dining rooms uh, started in England uh, in, uh, in the 1700s. And they came, they came to North America and they, 
really didn't get going until the late uh, 1800s, the mid to late 1800s. And even in floor plans, uh, they were called front parlor and back parlor. And they couldn't quite figure out where they were going to just dine and eat. And finally, towards um, they, they decided that they were going to eat in the back parlor. And, um, uh, and that, then that became a place, the part, like the front parlor was the place where you're going to impress everybody with all the nice things. But you also impressed people in the dining room. And there was a whole etiquette in the dining room. And that's how, you know, it had a whole thing to do with social status. And you, you could um, move up in status if you knew how to use the, uh, the different forks and knives. And for the host, uh, they could show off their lineage. They would put portraits of, of their lineage around the room. And so it became this, this, uh, an important room to show off your wealth and status. Yeah. And um, now what's quite interesting I find is that the dining room is disappearing. And so uh, just like in uh, Jennifer Siegel's house, uh, the dining room table is in the kitchen. But you know what? There's still that wealth and status thing happening even though the dining room's gone. I mean, you're showing your good taste with this, with her beautiful wood, rough wood table with the bark co coming off, you know, it, it, you're, you're just showing your interest and in status. Um, and I think it's great because you're sharing your food and your hospitality at the same time. But it's funny, it's, I think it's, 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 it's just a little bit different twist to our time. But I, John, I'd also say it's just, it's more interactive because as the host, I mean, if you're preparing the food, the whole point with the dining room would seem to be, like you had said, especially when you have servants, is that the food just magically appears. There's a divorcement of the eating from the preparation. But once you bring people into your kitchen, it's almost impossible to achieve that, right? It's got to become, it's a process. Like you, and I noticed that in, in Europe a lot that, uh, you know, maybe it was just the families I was visiting, but oftentimes the dining room would be really an extension of the kitchen. And it was very much a sense that the food just flowed. You know, it wasn't, there was no hiding um, how it was being prepared or the stages. It was all part of the, it was part of the evening. It was an evening's entertainment, right? Yeah. To be fed. Yeah. So I think that's a good thing, actually. I mean, oh. I, not that I want to see the dining room disappear, but I think it's great that people are, are more involved in the preparation part of the meal. Yes. Yes. And they were encouraged to be involved. Yeah. You yeah. also, I think you have a greater appreciation of it when it just doesn't appear magically, right? When you're actually kind of, although there can be a downside, I suppose, if, well, things, if things go awry, then you're going to be- was part, that, was, that was part of the mystique, though, in the, in the, in the 60s, that it did magically dis, uh, appear. I mean, I, it, my aunt, it was amazing. I mean, we would sit in the dining room waiting for the food to come out, and she had that swinging door uh, to the kitchen that nobody was allowed in the kitchen. And she'd be uh, in a perfect dress with pearls and beautiful <laughs> hair. And she'd come through that swinging door and with the dish we'd go, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then she'd go back <laughs> and the kids would come out with the roast. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Like a magician's trick. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so now, yeah, I agree. Instead of the whoa and this thing happening like this, it's, it's much more democratic to, um, to be in the kitchen with, with a person and help, help make the food. And, and it's also a result of the different gender roles that, that have happened since the 70s. So um, the, the last question I'm going to ask is one that came up uh, from the chat just now. And uh, it's, a, it's not even a question you have to answer. Um, but I, I'm, going to, I'm going to pose it simply because I think it shows how well you have involved this virtual audience uh you know i knew i knew from the outset that your infectious enthusiasm for i would say almost any topic but certainly for kitchens would have you know pardon the pun having everyone eating out of your hand <laughs> and uh more than a few people have you know wanted you to share recipes with them have wanted i think they want into your kitchen <laughs> somebody has said can i cook with you oh <laughs> yes okay 
Yeah. Sure. So I think that's just testimony to how, uh, you know, what an involving experience you've made this. I, I, <laughs> we're thrilled at Dennis that you chose to let us partner with you on our first virtual event. I don't think it could have been a, a, a less virtual seeming event than what we've had. So thank you so much, John. Thank you. Um, I now have to decide about who's going to get the, uh, the book. Oh. And um, I noticed that the um, that the attendees are not in the order they came on to the uh, event, but rather alphabetically. So what I'm going to ask you to do is yeah. choose a choose a letter, and the the first person uh, that comes up whose name starts with that letter is going to get the book. All right. I, you want me to pick the letter? Yeah, just pick a letter at random. C C for Char Charlie. Oh, good. Then I get the book. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. Uh, that's going to be, that will be Carol. Now, there are two Carols, and I will admit one of them is my mother-in-law. So uh, just because I don't, work that I don't want a scandal to emerge, um, no. I'll go with the other Carol. So, uh, but we're going to have to get that Carol to, uh, there's only one Carol. So not, the Carol who's not my mother-in-law. Um, <laughs> needs to, I guess is going to need to write me <laughs> and say, I'm the Carol. <laughs> I don't know how I, else I, to do it. I'm not the, I'm and the Carol. Then, and then the you will get that book, Carol. So there you have it. <laughs> uh, let me see. Yeah. So uh, that's, that's the way that works. Now, just the last thing I want to say is uh, we have another virtual event coming up on July 15th. Uh, with Phil Howard. Uh, some of you who are guests tonight may remember that Phil did our first alumni lecture uh, back in the spring of 2019. And Phil is a political scientist at Oxford, and he will be talking about the latest political developments. So I'm sure that's something that you will all want to join in on. So look for the announcement for that coming your way quite soon. But for now, I just want to say once again, thank you, John. Wonderful evening. Thank you. Uh, you and thank you for everybody being here. Thank you. Yeah. And, uh, and thanks, everyone, for coming. And we will see you again soon. Uh, the way we will end this is basically I'm just going to push my leave button, and John's going to push his leave button, and then the magical forces behind this event will cut the cord. OK. So, so good night, everyone. Thank you for coming. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.